Today I want to talk about something that is deeply embedded in the idiom of what Star Trek is and how it differs from other science fiction IPs. I'm talking, of course, about the transporter, about energize, about beam me up, Scotty, and what its place is and how it rests within Star Trek adventures as an RPG. If we look at the source material of the television shows and films within the Star Trek universe, then using the transporter is an everyday commonplace occurrence. It is the preferred mode of travel between planet side and starship, between two starships who are ready to go for it. It's the preferred means of inserting a commando raid. For that matter, it's the preferred means of extracting any of your people who are in hot water. And that says to me that within the logic that we get from the source material, within the calculus that the characters of that world use inside of their brains, the transporter is something reliable. So with that in mind, when is using the transporter a task? When isn't using the transporter a task within the rules of Star Trek Adventures? How do we consult with all those situations where away teams beam down in spite of some sort of complicating factor? Transport isn't quite as it should be, but the mission gets a green light in spite of those risks. I think this is a really important topic to consider about Star Trek Adventures. And part of that is because to my eyes, a lot of what I've seen in the culture of Game Masters is this feeling that the transporter is an irritant, it's a disruptor to the Game Master's preparations and plans. It's this easy button that the Game Master sees the players reaching for that overrides any sense of danger and escalation. Stop whining! And I put it to you that I think some of those feelings are misplaced. To stop whining. At least insofar as we want to run a Star Trek adventure. And we're not getting a great deal of help from the published adventures when it comes to examples of situations that will naturally arise from the challenges of a Star Trek story as, you know, a guide to consult with. For that matter, the rulebook offers some pretty scant advice about it as well. The only thing that we have to go on is this little section within the Starship combat section about transporter use and i think that it's important to remember that it's presented within that context that this is the difficulty these are the circumstances and the rules that dictate using the transporter when shields are up and red alert is blaring and there are enemies with guns pointed at your starship it's not necessarily that hard at any other time within an episode so coming from the situation where the transporter is either looked at with suspicion and wariness by the player characters who might not be ready to embrace it as a part of their Star Trek universe, with that perspective of some game masters who feel like it's an irritant in mind, and with the previously scant information on the topic, I am going to present to you my framework on how to use the transporter, how to run it in play. In Star Trek Adventures. If that's something that you think would be useful, then stay tuned. First, let's zoom in on a part of employing the transporter that is deeply embedded in the idiom of so many Star Trek episodes, which is away missions. Let's focus specifically on the beginning of away missions. From the moment the team assembles in the transporter room, through their consultation with the operator, and into the moment that they arrive at their destination. The most common context across the shows where using the transporter is taken for granted, the most common way that the transporter is used is off camera entirely. In other words, the player characters, after consulting on the bridge, after seeing something anomalous on planet or a ship in distress that requires a rescue team, after a consultation in a ready room about how something needs to be done about this, or that we really need to intervene after a talk with diplomats in the observation lounge, the next thing we see is the characters materializing on planet at their destination. In other words, using the transporter happened off camera. Not only was it not a task, but it was something which took place in between the scenes, in the gaps within the story. 
because that's part of Star Trek Adventure's television idiom that's embedded in the rules of the game, is that some things don't have to happen where anyone will see them. We just know because it's Star Trek and that's how it works. And within that body of scenes where things just get the ball rolling, the next thing we see the characters do is pull out their tricorders, aim their phasers at the darkness around them, and begin to get their bearings. In other words, everything about transport was nominal. There was nothing strange about it. It went just fine, which also means that as far as these characters know on this away mission, beaming out should have the same ease. After all, we do assume that these are competent Starfleet officers. And for that matter, the NPCs aboard their ships that may have pressed the button to energize are also competent. That means that they greenlit this away mission and everything looked fine and ready to go. There was no strong concerns as they began, which means that anything that happens to complicate the extraction of the away team later will be the sort of thing which will likely be a threat spend. It's a change to the scene. It's something which changes the calculus of the character's competence. These characters, had they known about whatever is about to happen that could keep them from beaming up, might not have made the same decision. And that's how Threat represents the Game Master putting things on tilt and springing things on the players and the characters. Let's examine two examples of this from the first season of TOS. The first is Arena. The Characters beam down to the colony observation world and they're surveying the wreckage of the Gorn attack when the Gorn vessel suddenly arrives in orbit and they get a radio call from Sulu informing them of the peril that the ship is in, that they had to raise shields and even flee from orbit. So we have a pretty good rubric for how much threat that would cost. To outmatch the 1701 would require a ship of her size or larger, say four to six threat, to remove that possibility that the characters will be able to beam out. And in Return of the Archons, a similar thing happens. A heat beam is trained onto the 1701, and Scotty, consulting with Kirk in the away team, tells him that they can't beam him up, and not only that, that the ship's orbit is decaying. We've heard from earlier episodes that this orbital decay situation is a sort of trait which can escalate and become more dire. So we perhaps have the heat beam as a trait which is entered into the scene, which precludes transport, maybe four or three threat for that, and then two threat for this orbital decay trait, which may escalate over time at the cost of threat and also at the prospect of increased peril for the 1701 and all souls aboard it. Now, of course, for a great many away missions, nothing unforeseen happens to make beam out any more complicated. The mission just happens. One of the away team members gets kidnapped or gets into legal trouble. Or perhaps a terrible truth is learned by the away team and they beam up and the next thing we see is them in the observation lounge explaining to the crew what sort of dire things they saw down on the planet. It could be that the commando raid of swashbuckling and phaser fire gets off to a raring start after the away team materializes successfully. In other words, sometimes there's nothing problematic about the prospect of beam out once the mission is complete. In my estimation, about two thirds of the times that the transporter is used to begin an away mission to change scenes within Star Trek, it's within this idiom where it happens entirely off camera. Next, let's look at the other third of away missions, the sort where the away team commander walks into the transporter room and begins consulting with the transporter chief about what the problems of this particular transport are going to be. Let's just imagine a very certain character from TNG and his particular Irish accent that I'm going to very poorly imitate. This is your favorite transporter room, isn't it? Number three. Yes, sir. There's some heavy particle scattering and I'll have to boost the confinement beam. I could only beam up or down two of you at a time. Or perhaps the away team commander sternly instructs that same transporter chief. 
Maintain a positive lock at all times. I want us out of there at the first sign of trouble. There's a 30-minute cycle in the planet's ionosphere when the magnetic fields align and we can get a window for transport. What we see happening here is a sequence of traits being established for the coming scene. The constraints of transport are laid down and they include things like an advantage being required for beam out. We can imagine the transporter chief saying something like, the energy field's unstable. A positive lock is impossible. I'll need you to transmit the coordinates before I can energize the scanning beam. A difficulty one con task from the team leader. Transport will occur at the end of a combat round, if combat's taking place, and everyone within the same zone might be beamed up together in circumstances like that. Or an advantage is set down in play by a player character. They need a positive lock. The team leader has created an advantage, perhaps with a make it so determination spend, and he'll be calling for transport as a minor action on his turn should combat arise. Now this is the sort of advantage which might erode because of complications with the scene, and it might require tasks for it to be held and maintained and kept true as things unfold and get wilier within the environment of the away team. Uh, one example of this might be the Tasha's sister episode where they beam down into a hive city. Sometimes there's a trait in play that constrains the time or place or number of characters that can be beamed at once. To override this might require additional warp power to be shunted to the transporter. In other words, the ship might be vulnerable to attack, there might be complications that could arise that increase the complication range of other things going on in the ship because this power has been devoted to this purpose. In all of the cases, though, the consultation between the team leader and the transporter chief is brief. The transporter operator often speaks as if he's under the constraint of a professional code of ethics. It's as if he's a doctor or a lawyer. You may recognize this from some occasions in your life where you're talking to a stern doctor who's telling you to stop doing something unhealthy, or perhaps when we plead before a traffic magistrate for leniency when we've gotten a parking ticket or the like. And there's sort of a standing directive that seems to apply to a lot of these transporter operators. Something like, the surgeon's knife cuts to save lives, not to end them. Time and time again, we see that there are certain lines that transporter operators won't cross as they hold in their hands people's lives, as the scanning beam literally tears people's bodies apart to reassemble them on the pad. And so there's a lot of moral gravity to the person's actions behind that console. And there's respect for that, which almost reaches beyond the chain of command. On rare occasions, we see that that value gets challenged, often with grim implications, and it takes persuasive overtures which reach to the level of a task. It's here that I'll point you toward an obscure rule within the core rulebook, which is to say, when an NPC's value is challenged, add three to threat. And with that, I will come right out and say it. I think that in most of these conventional away team scenes, the transporter operator is an NPC. Permission to disembark, Captain. I think that this is often the case even in the episodes where there's some meaningful dialogue that goes back and forth between the team leader and the transporter chief. And I think there's some support for this argument that the transporter chief ought to be an NPC. The first support that I have is that we recognize that feeling that it's out of our hands, this verdict that the doctor or the traffic magistrate or the lawyer or the judge that we're standing in front of is out of our control. It's something that it just happens. And that feeling that we really need to do our very best to argue our case it really coincides with the feeling of a character arguing to an NPC. The second support for this is the simple nature of an away team. Most of the scene is going to happen uh, on planet at the destination. So with that in mind, it doesn't make a great deal of sense that a main character 
or a supporting character would be brought into the scene and a character would be chosen by a player to, to be their main character for the scene. And then the scene would just leave them behind. Whoosh. And, you know, this might even come at the cost of crew support for the rest of the mission. So it makes sense that probably all the player characters that are going to be in the scene uh, are going to evaporate on the transporter pad and rematerialize at the destination. And the third support for this is a, a little bit more nuanced. It's basically to say that when you walk in the room and the transporter chief is there boop, 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 on his control panel, there's often the implication that he's been hard at work getting everything just so, so that the transport will go off without a hitch. There's something about NPCs that we can do that it's harder to do with player characters, which is to say that they've been doing stuff when you weren't looking, when the game wasn't looking. You can walk into the room and the transporter chief can have a bevy of advantages stacked up to keep that difficulty at zero, in spite of whatever traits are in play, in spite of whatever difficulties, which can include things like rotating magnetic fields and particle scattering, or perhaps we're beaming through a particular part of the enemy's shields because we've gotten just that ability to find their shield frequency and we've got a little window where we can make it happen. But it's tough. It's the sort of thing which would take a lot of work to make sure that it will go off just right. Well, here's the way that Star Trek tends to handle away missions. Even in those circumstances where there's the difficulty, Picard turns to Riker and says, Assemble an away team. Riker says, Mr. LaForge, meet me in transporter room four. Mr. Worf, you're with me. And with that, the two of them depart the bridge with confidence into the turbo lift. It's that ability to count on an NPC to count on the doctor the way that many of us do to take care of us when our health is on the line that I think speaks to the idea that the transporter operator, at least in these circumstances that revolve around away teams, is perhaps the sort of person that it makes sense can be a non-player character. One that develops over time, one who has their own quirks as far as what they will and won't do in the line of duty, or perhaps just some kind of other silly things. Maybe they ask for a cup full of sand from the worlds that the player characters are beaming down to so that they can assemble it as a collection. There's all manner of little flavorants that can come into play to create an affection and also deepen the respect for the judgment of that operator and also make it Something tough to consider to give them a direct order to go against those values that they hold so dearly. I think that moral code of the transporter operator is the sort of thing that player characters can often find themselves in the shoe in as well. And with that, I've got you teed up for episode two of investigating the transporter in play in Star Trek Adventures. Today we learned that two thirds of the time at least on the Star Trek television shows, the transporter is not only not a task, it happens before the scene or after the scene is over with. It's the connective tissue. In a great deal of the other one third of the time in which away missions come into play, the transporter operator is perhaps an NPC, an NPC who has been hard at work off camera before the player characters arrive in the scene working to push down the difficulty of their own tasks so that those tasks are difficulty zero and the sort of thing that doesn't need to be rolled for. The whole conversation of what sort of crew are NPCs and what sort of crew are player characters, be they main characters or supporting characters that are activated with crew support, is a deep one. And I think it comes down to a lot of not only the idiom of how certain sorts of scenes within Star Trek episodes unfold as we visited here, but also has a great deal to do with just the way that this game of Star Trek Adventures plays. And it's something that I hope will find its way into a revised edition core rulebook, because I think it's a very important consideration. 
there are crew members that join the show, at least temporarily. People like Shelby and Captain Jellico that are very clearly NPCs. For that matter, though, I think there is a great deal of fun to be had introducing NPC crew members who are on the same team as the player characters, but may not always agree, but can be up to their own agenda off camera in a way that player characters can't be. They can have reservations about the course of action that the core group of folks on the bridge and in the observation rounds, those folks that compose the player character party, they might have reservations. They, they might not want to be 100% with this way of doing things. And some conflict may arise. I think it's great to develop your campaign with these sorts of characters in mind. Not as obstacles, but as part of the truth of living in the Star Trek universe. That's a video for another time. Next time, we're going to talk about away team extraction and the MacGuffin-y uses of transporters in Star Trek Adventures. Yes, the sort of things that are tasks and will take a die roll from player characters. If you've enjoyed this video, as it's informed you about perhaps how to think of the transporter within your games of Star Trek Adventures, throw a like on it. Why don't you subscribe? If you like videos that consider thoughts about tabletop role-playing in an incredibly deep fashion, as we are wont to do here on the channel, even in these dire times, then why don't you subscribe? Because I, I'm going to, of course, do more of them because I enjoy them. Have a good one, folks. I hope that you're staying safe out there in these very strange days.